Well, they didn't consider us a branch of the service. I was in the Merchant Marine. I was going to be drafted, and the Navy told me to go to the Merchant Marine since I was colorblind. Tried to get in the Navy Air Force, and I was colorblind. So then uh, went down to the Navy, and, uh, you know, everything happened so fast then. Boy, just everybody was taken up with the war. I tried to get in the Navy, and they wouldn't do it, so they suggested, uh, since I was colorblind, that I should go to the Merchant Marine. And I thought, that sounds good. It was on the water instead of out in the mud, so I thought that sounded real good to us. What did you know about the war in Europe? Oh, we didn't, uh, you know, we saw things, St. Louis Star Times, you know, we get the paper, and you see some things about it, but it wasn't close to you, so you really didn't know much about it. But then on uh, Pearl Harbor, you know, during that, you know, December 7th, uh, we all knew about it. Went back to high school. I knew I was going to have to go someplace. I had gone to Jefferson Barracks, and uh, they examined me and 30 other guys, and I was one of the ones that said, well, you look pretty good to me. You were breathing, you got red blood and things like that. And so uh, I knew I was going to have to go in. So uh, I thought, well, let's join and see if I'd get into something I wanted to get into. The Navy would not accept colorblind people, which is par for the course. I didn't know that at the time. And so I went and you signed up and you were going to, they had a maritime training school and uh, it was near Brooklyn, New York, Sheepshead Bay. And it was basically uh, probably a nine week school or something like that. But I didn't know anything about it. All I knew is I was going to go. I was still living at home, right? And uh, I was digging ditches with the St. Louis County Gas Company for a couple months, you know, until it was time to go. My older sister married a man in the Navy. He uh, joined the Navy, and uh, he was in the Navy. And uh, what? I don't know. You know, what, what kind of funny stuff did you see? Terry and the Pirates or somebody like that? Flash Gordon or <laughs> whoever? Uh, you didn't know much about it. I imagine it's just like typical little kids now, except they won't let them play uh, uh, cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians. They can't do that anymore. But it was that type of thing. It wasn't really a lark, you know, it was dead serious. And uh, uh, we knew we were involved. We, it was, uh, we knew, you knew all about Europe and what was happening over there with, with Hitler. Didn't know anything at the time uh, to start with about Japan, but we knew about Pearl Harbor and what they had done. Just a goofy kid. Uh, had to have a haircut. Issued clothes to you. I remember the shoes, I, I kidded the guy a little bit and he made him mad, the quartermaster. I said, you take two steps before these shoes start moving on me, they're that big. Well, I'll wear more socks. And so <laughs> it was about that. Uh, slept in barracks, three bunks high. Uh, just uh, whatever the typical training was, march, mostly you teach you discipline and what you're doing. And then they had various training schools which uh, gunnery school, some navigation, points of the compass, uh, taking care of yourself. Basic training was the same as boot camp with the Navy or the Coast Guard, and uh, we were close to them, same type of uniforms. Uh, uh, I don't know that it was any, anything other than that, but I found out there was a cook and baker school, and since my folks had a small bakery, I thought, I should go do that. So I so I thought I'd give it a try. So anyway, I, un I got into Cook and Baker School. Probably, uh, I don't know, I, had a, I showed you the picture of it earlier. I don't know, there must have been eight or ten of us, something like that. I was the only one with any experience at all, quote, unquote, in the culinary line. And my background was, was bakery. And I knew how to do bakery. And I knew how to decorate cakes. Uh, and, and I did that. Uh, I remember one of the final deals was we all had to make a like a layer cake, a three layer cake, probably a 10 inch pan or a 12 inch pan. And uh, The old fellow that ran the place was an old sauerkraut, an old German, and uh, he came in and he was looking and there all the cakes were sitting on the benches. Well, he was going to get try the taste test. Well, he reaches his hand right in the middle of it and I had it all decorated like a birthday cake. All the other cakes were just plain, you know, but mine was decorated. And, boy. Made me just madder than a devil, you know. And I thought, boy, oh boy, I know about people like that. 
Well, to make a long story short about that, uh, I was in among the top in the class, and I knew I wanted to get on something that had electric ovens and electric stoves, because by that time they were producing Liberty ships, and Liberty ships were, I guess, basically coal-fired in the kitchen, and uh, uh, diesel, uh, smoke, a lot of things like that. No real control. If you, if you know something about cooking and baking, you like to have control. When you set the oven at 350, you like it to be at 350 instead of maybe. So I got on there, and that's how I got started with the tankers. I got a tanker, and I had a funny experience with that. It was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they were working on a ship. It was in dry dock. So uh, here, go up the gangplank and do all these things and found out uh, where the quarters were for the, for the baker, cook and baker. The chief cook and the, and the baker stayed, stayed in the, usually the same forecastle. And I guess they changed shifts somewhere about 1230, midnight. Man, oh man, we had been trained in general quarters, you know, and boy, I grabbed the life jacket and I just had my skivvies on and topside, boy, right up there and I was right at the rail. And there was about 300 people looking at me with all the lights on. <laughs> I was going overboard. <laughs> The Merchant Marine was uh, set up once we were at war, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, developed what they call the War Shipping Administration. And the War Shipping Administration had the, the uh, uh, responsibility of, let's see if we can't get a bunch of ships together to get stuff going to Europe, right, at that time. And Japan, too, also. But at that time, when they first started out, it was Europe. So they basically, we had very little merchant marine, the merchant marine being the ships that we had uh, on private ownership. And we had very, very little bit of that. So uh, gradually, why uh, Henry Kaiser started making ships and he knew how to make Liberty ships and made hundreds of them. So, uh, but then other ships. Now I was on a tanker, particularly tankers, because I liked the electric idea and, and the ovens and the stoves and all that. So a lot of that came from some of the Greek shipping tycoons. They're the ones that pretty well controlled tankers, and tankers hold petroleum. And so that's, that's how I got involved in that. And after that, throughout the rest of the time, why? Uh, uh, I tried to get on a tanker, and I did. When you went, uh, the way it worked out on this thing, and I, I wanted you to know this a little bit, it was all done through union halls. On the East Coast, it was the NMA, National Maritime Union. And on the West Coast, it was the uh, Seamen's Union of the Pacific, Seafarers Union of the Pacific. And those were the two unions. So you had to go to the union hall. Uh, how did I know? How to, I don't remember all the different things I did. Uh, I thumbed to the West Coast and did things, uh, New Orleans, different places. And you went to the union hall and tried to find a ship. And in my case, I was looking particularly for a tanker. And that's, that's how I did. The first ship I was on was a tanker, the Manassas. I remember that one. I don't remember a lot of the other ones. And we went to South America and, uh, and back again to Marcus Hook, went into Philadelphia. And from then, I hadn't been home in five or six months. And uh, so went home and then I went different places, uh, West Coast, uh, South Coast, whatever, New Orleans, West Coast too. The missions were always varied. Uh, uh, one time I got on a ship in uh, one of the latter trips that I took in Galveston, Texas. And from there, after they had the crew, the crew uh, pretty well complimented how many people we needed to fill all the berths and so on. A typical tanker had about 40, 42, 45 people, plus or minus, depending on who they could get and how many they could get. We went up to Port Arthur then, and uh, into Beaumont Shipping Channel, and we loaded up, and I have no idea what we loaded up with. Uh, did we load up with gasoline or what? But we went then from there to Dakar, French West Africa. For safety, they finally got the idea, Admiral King, uh, who was pretty well headed up the Navy, he never would have protection for their merchant ships. So finally, I don't know what the dates were exactly or anything, but I'd say about 1943, he decided we would give protection to the merchant ships. 
they developed convoys, and these were all cargo ships. And they had tanks and airplanes and munitions and whatever to carry to Europe. The tankers traveled alone because if they were hit, there were no survivors. Went from Dakar, then we went into the Persian Gulf, uh, Rastanura, Bahrain Island, which is now part of Kuwait, I imagine. Went into those areas, and then from there we went into the South Pacific. And uh, the lower end of, uh, I'm trying to, trying to think of the name of the, uh, Batangas, it was in the Philippines. And I think we probably carried gasoline down there, but I don't know for sure, possibly in there. And from there, then we went back into the Persian Gulf and uh, loaded up 17 hours and through the Suez Canal to Italy. And from Italy, uh, we went back, let's see, I guess from Italy on that trip in the Mediterranean through Gibraltar, and then back down to uh, Aruba and Carousel. Aruba's been on the news recently for a bad reason, not a good reason, but you didn't see anything about the tourist situation because there was no such thing. The big attraction for Aruba and Carousel were the refineries. And we loaded up with there and uh, probably gasoline and took it back to the United States, back into the Galveston area. And that was the end of the trip. And you signed off. The bad thing about this was, uh, what did you sign? We were gone probably six months. And uh, they paid you, paid you in cash. Cash money right there. The purser uh, distributed the money and you were discharged, so to speak. Uh, go home, go wherever you want to go. And that was the, the way it was. They so just unlike the service in that way. You had to take care of yourself uh, totally, all the time. Even when you're on the ship, you had to take care of yourself, too. Then I probably stayed home for maybe two weeks or something like that. And where did I go from there? I think probably to the West Coast the next time. And uh, caught a ship. And uh, it, was, it was full. I think we went into the South Pacific immediately from there. And then from the South Pacific, you go back into the Persian Gulf. But uh, uh, those are the main, main places you would go. The ships, the, if you caught a a tanker off the East Coast, it probably went into, uh, uh, came all the way around, went up to Baton Rouge, up the Mississippi River, loaded up, and then had to go out into the Gulf. And yeah. maybe make it, maybe not. You had to have been in a war zone. Well, what was a war zone? Do you think the Gulf of Mexico was a war zone? No, it wasn't. There was probably only 200 ships sunk there, but it was not a war zone. The war zones where there was actual uh, uh, warfare. There was actual warfare in uh, uh, in the area such as Europe. Actual warfare in the islands uh, uh, in in the South Pacific. But uh, our our term was completed August fifteenth. And August fifteenth, I was in the South Pacific. Shake the hand. I shook the hand. I shook the plane. I shook Japan. The Enola Gay. And we delivered uh, some of the fuel for the Enola Gay. Typical day on a ship for me was probably get up at, uh, a typical ship would be operated on uh, three portions a day. 12 to 4 was the first watch. Second watch was 4 to 8. And the third watch then was from 8 to 12. You're on four hour, hours and off eight. But in the galley, why you were on whatever it took to do it. So we were usually up about 6 o'clock, uh, 5.30 or 6, and the second cook and baker's job was for breakfast. So you had con total control of the breakfast and uh, uh, to feed the crew. The crew took, some were on duty, some were off duty. So uh, during that period of time. Then you was kind of light for just maybe an hour or two until they got all the potatoes peeled and everything. And then the second cook and baker was also in charge of all the vegetables. The chief cook took care of the entrees, the meats, and things like that. Uh, but you had the second cook uh, took care of that, had all the salads. And uh, then you were off in the afternoon after lunch, uh, probably for two hours. And, that, and so then you were ready for for the supper meal, whatever you want to call it, evening meal, supper. 
that it was a supper meal, and then after supper, why, it was over. Uh, the mess boys did a lot of the cleaning up. You usually had one or two, a third cook or a galley man that would help clean up, things like that. But that was your typical day, a humdrum out at sea, totally. Uh, we were on that period of time. If you got into some place, uh, went into Manila Harbor, uh, I remember I took off in the afternoon, went ashore there, and uh, looked around. You know, it was kind of boogered up and everything. But it had an interesting thing happen. I was taken on a ship, a merchant ship, and I guess they were just about to crucify the baker because he didn't know how to make bread. And in the meantime, all these other chores I was telling you about, you also had to make the bread for the crew and cake and rolls and anything that you could think of. And I had some ideas of my own because I knew a little bit about baking because of my folks, you know. So, uh, but anyway, I taught him how to make bread. The tankers ran, had generators because it was diesel electric. And so we had generator problems one time and we went into... Uh, Colombo Salon, which is now Sri Lanka, and uh, then also into Bombay and uh, there. And uh, we didn't know that, they, that ships were, that uh, cows were sacred. And so this one dumb farm boy from Kansas, he was almost as bad as us dumb ones from Missouri, uh, he had a little bit to drink and he kicked one. And we never saw him again. <laughs> Excuse me. I had to have vaccinations for you on ashore. Kind of interesting how they vaccinated you. They put three cuts on your arm, and then they put the serum or whatever they used, and then cut back the other way. Can you imagine what your typical arm looked like in three days? <laughs> some of the guys had arms like that on them, you know. You had to do that before you could go ashore. Well, some of them weren't fit to go ashore on that. Uh, there wasn't much to tell in, in Manila. Uh, you could go ashore and uh, uh, try to get some beer, what have you. A little, little bit of boozing up there. Uh, a lot of the guys with the Merchant Marine, when they went ashore, you were more or less a loner. Uh, for some reason or other, I gravitated to the, some of the older guys. Uh, nothing fascinating happened. I don't, you know, I don't remember that. It was just... You, you went someplace, uh, you unloaded, took anywhere from 18, 20 hours, depending on how long you had to stay in the harbor to find a berth to undo that. Uh, then whenever you went to, it uh, didn't matter if it was Port of La Cruz, Venezuela, or Carousel, or Aruba, or where, uh, it only took about 17 hours. And you loaded up and you're gone. Crews were basically young, except for some of the old guys. There was a few older ones around. And, uh, you know, they were old. They were in their 40s and 50s. And most of us were just young. Typical officers, uh, very, very young. We had captain on one ship that was like 30 years old. And some of the mates. Uh, the engine crew uh, uh, was made up of a couple officers, uh, one or two officers, and the oilers. Uh, minimum crew, if you can imagine. Uh, you know, they're only like... Uh, three or four guys down in the engine room uh, because he was on four hours and off eight. And it was a different set. You had three different groups coming in there. Some of them was a way of life. You know, they, they were on a ship. And uh, uh, I don't know if you realize this, that you weren't around some of the old, what we call rummies. <laughs> I used to see them in the seaports and that. But uh, they'd go ashore. They'd drink too much. And uh, most, of the, most of these guys were deckhands and uh, worked on the, on the deck. Uh, and it was a sanctuary, a security forum, I guess, what have you. Uh, some of the old cooks, uh, uh, the, the very first cook I had, he and I had to get things straight to start with. I think I was making some salad. He was originally from Denmark. And I was making some salad, and he said, you're not feeding the bunch of cattle here. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're feeding men. And he was on me about several different things. And when he got on to me, some of the things about making uh, baking goods, which were cakes and, and uh, rolls and bread, uh, he and I got straight away right quick. 
And uh, I don't know if any butcher knives were used, but I think there were some <laughs> flashed around that. But after that, he left me alone. And if you were in the Merchant Marine, you had to pretty well uh, I don't know how to say, just be on your own, I guess. Well, the regimental structure uh, of some of the men worked up, uh, like the Marine Corps, and it's still that way because we lived close to Paris Island uh, recently, and uh, uh, a lot of them started out buck privates and they went all the way to general. But the same way with that, they worked their way as a, uh, on the deck crew, they worked their way until they found out about navigation. At that time, it was celestial navigation. They found out what made a ship tick, how to run it, and that idea, and finally got his master's ticket after a number of years. But there was also, uh, what I want to say, the uh, King's Point, which is Merchant Marine Academy. And there was a fellow I went to high school with went there to the Merchant Marine Academy. And he came out as a third officer and a second officer and a first officer. I don't think he ever made master of the ship. But that was the way the structure was. The bosun was in charge of the deck crews. The steward was in charge of the, uh, of the kitchen, the culinary thing. And then the chief engineer, who had the same rank as the, as the skipper on, a, on board ship. And that was the way the structure was. Uh, as far as uniforms when you went ashore, uh, sometimes there was a uniform, depends on what you wanted to wear. Towards after the war was over, we had a, a bunch of uh, Skylark type of guys. <laughs> they, they just wore anything and everything. But uh, at the first and during the war, while you had a, uh, uh, like a, a Navy uh, enlisted man's uniform, uh, a second, second cook, uh, chief cook, uh, we had a dark uniform, gray shirts, gray tie. But uh, that, that's how that was, the way the structure was. Uh, it wasn't loose. Everything was defined. You knew where you were all the time. So uh, it wasn't, wasn't anything like the military in respect to somebody gave orders to somebody to somebody to somebody. When the captain gave order, when you're tying up someplace, he gave the orders. He didn't tell the first mate about it, but he gave it, and the first mate had his own chores to do as long as the second mate and so on. Uh, same way with the with the uh, stewards department. The, uh, uh, didn't have to give too many orders. You know what the work was to do, and you did the work. VE day, uh, probably in Aruba or Port of La Cruz, someplace like that. Oh God, God, that's great. It's over. You know, it's over. But it wasn't over. Uh, German U-boats were still there. They didn't get the word right away. And in the same way, VJ Day, I was at Tinian. I was part of the Marianas, and that's where the uh, B-29s took off. But from there, it continued on. Uh, the whole world was dry. They needed to be refueled, so to speak. And they asked you to stay on. Uh, nobody told anybody anything about what was happening in the real live world about losses. We didn't know. No, on tankers, you just, uh, you kept going. Uh, a lot of the poor guys that were sunk, <laughs> anyway, convoys couldn't stop and tankers didn't stop. You didn't pick up anybody. It was over. And uh, I guess, damn. Okay. Anyway, if a ship was lost, why well, there was no notification to anybody. I did take one trip that was interesting. It was going to be a short trip, and I knew it was a short trip. And I, I can't tell you where I signed on, whether I signed on at uh, Marcus Hook out of Philadelphia or where. Uh, it was a victory ship. And uh, victory ships came at the end of the war. They were much faster than the old Liberty ships. The victory ships would probably do uh, 10 or 12 knots. Tankers could do 14, 15 knots fast. And uh, we had 504 mules. And UNRWA, which was United Nations Relief, deal set up by one of the generals, I don't remember his name right now, and we went to Trieste 
which is in Yugoslavia. And uh, we lost four mules, so we still had 500. And magnificent animals. God, they were beautiful. You know, all had to be 17, 18 hands high. They weren't the little scrawny mules that you see. These were beautiful animals. By that time, uh, everybody, you know, the farm labor problem was there. They didn't have any animals or anything. Everything had been slaughtered. And the same way with most of them. I would imagine that a minimum of 300 of those mules were hit in the head in the first alley they came to, killed and eaten. But uh, then we returned back, and uh, I forget where I went, probably New Orleans the next trip I went to on, and well, I got on a ship. But that was, that was a one, one different one. The Norwalk Victory was the name of that ship. I wanted to go to school, and uh, I, I thought to be a forester would be just great. So... Uh, had trouble getting to school. Missouri did not have accredited forestry school, which meant they didn't have a staff to run a forestry school. Finally got into Utah State. And that was kind of interesting. Utah State had about 2,000 students. And all of a sudden, here comes all the veterans from all over World War II converged on Logan, Utah. And suddenly they had 10,000 students. But they, that's when I was really uh, awakened to the Merchant Marine, what it was about, some of the things went about. Uh, I was going to say going to enlist, but he had to register for the, for the school. And I wanted to register for the forestry school, but she had to register to start with. And I saw a fellow that was in the armed guard, and I was in the same gun crew uh, with him. And so we lined up, guess what? He got the GI Bill, and I was told to get in that line over there. And so I got nothing, absolutely nothing. He got all of his books. He got all of his tuition and $117 a month or something like that. If you were married, you got $10 more. And so that was the first of it. But the bad part was uh, humiliation, scuffed at, scorned. Uh, you were never a part of the veterans. Uh, in fact, I had to take ROTC. I had to take two years ROTC because I was not considered a veteran, uh, even though I had 40 hours of gunnery school on ship. Uh, then went through school. Uh, that was interesting. There were a whole bunch of people thought that the Forest Service would be a green suit situation. Well, it didn't turn out that way. Forestry was real heavy to mathematics. Uh, about 170 started out and 31 of us finished up in school. Then towards the end of the school, you had to take, uh, like the kids have now in high school, uh, you had to take a test. Uh, it was a typical civil service test. Well, if, you, if I made 80 points, which was very good, uh, and my buddy that was the ex-GI, he made 75, but he got 10 points for being a GI. So he now had 85 points. And... Uh, and of course, that's the first jobs went to them. Uh, then I became a forester and what have you. But uh, that went on through. Eventually, the Forest Service asked me if I would come and join them, and I did. And uh, a fellow sitting next to me had about four years. Uh, he was in the Army and, and then the Navy both. He was kind of a uh, whatever. Uh, guess what? On retirement, I had 26 years total time, and he had... 30 years, because his four years in military counted as part of his retirement. And of course, it made quite a bit of difference in retirement at the time. And that kind of just followed you all the way through until you were always aware of it. And uh, VFW, American Legion, uh, you weren't a part of it. Uh, as part as uh, whatever, you know, veterans, hospital or anything. No, you aren't welcome there, any place like that. My answer to some of this was, uh, you're in the Army. How do you think your shoes got to Europe? Where do you think the fuel came from to run uh, Bradley's machine or whatever? How do you think all the tanks were run? How do you think the airplanes flew? That was all delivered by the Merchant Marine. Everything, tanks, everything was delivered. The Navy had some tankers, yes, but they refueled their own ships. And one time we did refuel at sea 
onto another Navy tanker to refuel him. I guess the funny part about it was, oh, you're in the Merchant Marine, you made that big money, you know, uh, all these things. Well, I don't remember the big money. I, I, think, uh, I think I made $72 a month to start with and eventually got up to about $110 a month, about the same whatever, uh, whatever the uh, second class petty officer would be in the Navy. Uh, uh, just there, there was no there was no benefit of any kind whatsoever. You were always on the outside, and I guess that's one reason I decided to interview with you. I wanted to tell you that story. It's a, it, it, was, it to me it didn't seem fair. Nobody knew the danger. They didn't know the danger in the in the military, the Navy, Coast Guard, and they didn't know it because nobody told anybody anything. That just started coming out about 50 years ago. How many planes were lost, submarines. Uh, the losses were tremendous. Nobody knew that. You just a just a dumb kid got on the next ship and took off again. If you're going to have a free society, uh, you're going to have to have some wars because you have to take care of yourself. Uh, we've been lucky in this country. We're over here and it's over there. But they brought it to us on 9/11, as you know, just about six years ago. Uh, the next generation better recognize that. I feel really bad what the uh, educational people are doing to our children. Cops and robbers was all part of growing up. It was all part of running, running back through the field and, and running away. Cowboys and Indians was all part of growing up. And again, take care of yourself. You don't stand there and be a mama baby and you beg for this and you beg for that. Uh, sometimes there's good food available, sometimes there isn't. You know how to, you know how to fix your own. Go in and get a graham cracker peanut butter sandwich if you have to. But that's what I'd tell them is, is uh, I want the parents to be able to take care of their kids and I want them to take care and teach their kids. Uh, there's there's a, a real, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact words to use, but the, you have to be able to take care of ourselves and our country. And if there's any kind of an invasion, uh, no matter what, I understand the Japanese, somebody asked them, why didn't you ever try and invade the United States? You were in a position to do so. And they said, no, they knew that uh, about one out of every three people in the United States had a gun. I'm a life member of the National Rifle Association. And uh, I believe in that very strongly. I don't believe I'm going out and, and uh, doing somebody in particularly, but I think they have to know how to defend themselves, take care of themselves and, and their families always. The so Merchant Marine still exists, but again, through the politicians and through the people that will do it the cheapest and what have you, uh, somebody else is sending the ships over here instead of, instead of our ships. I think the United States has very few ships. Most of them are owned by uh, big composite groups throughout the world. We have very few ships. I hope we do get some benefits uh, out of the thing, only to recognize that, that you were there, you did a job, and you were never thanked.